In this video, we're going to talk about capacitors. Capacitors are devices that store electrical energy. They're different from batteries. Batteries store electricity in the form of chemical energy. Capacitors, they can charge and discharge at a very rapid rate, whereas batteries, they take a long time to charge or discharge. And this is due to the fact that capacitors have a very, very, very low internal resistance compared to batteries. Now, on the left, what we have is a polarized capacitor. And on the right, it's a non-polarized capacitor. Polarized capacitors typically include electrolytic capacitors, and they have a much higher capacitance than the non-polarized capacitors, such as the mica or the tantalum capacitors. A typical electrolytic capacitor can have a, a capacitance of 100 microfarads, whereas a non-polarized capacitor may have a capacitance of 10 nanofarads. So keep in mind, one microfarad is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 6 farads, whereas a nanofarad is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 9 farads. Now let's spend some time talking about the unit of capacitance, that is, the farad. What is a farad? The farad basically tells you the ratio of charge to voltage. A 1 farad capacitor can store 1 column of charge when it's charged up by 1 volt. If you charge up that capacitor to a voltage of 10 volts, it's going to hold 10 columns of charge. If the capacitor has 100 volts across it, it can hold 100 columns of charge. So the farad, or the unit of capacitance, it tells you how much charge can the capacitor hold per unit volt, or per 1 volt. So, for instance, let's compare a 10 farad capacitor with a 100 farad capacitor. A 10 farad capacitor can hold 10 columns of charge when a 1 volt battery is connected across it. In contrast, a 100, a 100 farad capacitor can hold 100 columns of charge when a 1 volt battery is connected across it. So in summary, the capacitance of a capacitor tells you how much charge the capacitor can hold when it has a voltage of 1 volt across it. Now, when deciding to buy a capacitor, there are two important things you need to look at. The capacitance, which we spoke of, and the voltage that the capacitor can hold. It has a maximum voltage level, where if you exceed that, the capacitor can be destroyed. So let's say that the maximum voltage rating of this capacitor is 16 volts. If you know the voltage and the capacitance, you can calculate the charge that you could store on that capacitor. So for this capacitor, we have a capacitance of 100 microfarads, which is 100 times 10 to the minus 6 farads, and it's charged up to a voltage of 16 volts. So multiplying those two numbers gives us a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs. Now you might be wondering, what is a coulomb? A coulomb is a unit of charge. One coulomb is equal to a current of 1 amp flowing for 1 second. So thus we have this formula, Q is equal to IT. So let's understand what this formula is telling us. Let's say we have a capacitor that has 100 coulombs of charge stored across it. So this capacitor can unleash 100 amps in one second, or it can release one amp over a time period of 100 seconds, or it could release 10 amps in 10 seconds. So knowing the total amount of charge across the capacitor or stored in a capacitor can tell you how much current this capacitor can release in a given time period. And you could control the amount of current released by a capacitor by putting a resistor across it. So here we have a picture of different types of capacitors. On the left, these two are non-polarized capacitors. On the right, these are polarized capacitors. You can see on the left, this gray strip tells you the negative terminal of the polarized capacitor. The mica capacitor 
and this other non-polarized capacitor, they have a relatively low capacitance. You can see this one is only 6.8 microfarads, whereas this particular electrolytic capacitor has a capacitance of 680 microfarads. On the right, what we have is a supercapacitor. The capacitance is 100 farads, which is many times more than 680 microfarads. So supercapacitors can store a lot of charge. But there's a trade-off though. Notice the voltage across this supercapacitor. It's relatively low, only 2.7 volts. This one has a voltage of 16 volts. And this one is a high voltage capacitor. It can store a voltage up to uh, 250. So that's one drawback of a supercapacitor. It has a, a very large capacitance, but the voltage across it can only go up to 2.7 volts without damaging uh, this particular device. So here is another picture of two electrolytic capacitors. The one on the left is a low voltage capacitor. It can hold a voltage of 16 volts and the capacitance that it can store is a thousand microfarads, which is equivalent to one millifarad. On the right, we have a high voltage capacitor. The capacitance is not that low, it's 100 microfarads, but the voltage that this one can hold, it can go up to 400 volts, which is very useful for uh, DC to DC uh, voltage booster circuits. So now here are some other capacitors. So you've seen this one already. This is a supercapacitor with a capacitance of 100 farads. Next, we have another supercapacitor, which has a capacitance of 500 farads. And on the right, this one is huge. It has a capacitance of 3,000 farads. But the voltage for each of these is the same, 2.7 volts. So here is a question for you. Let's say we have two different capacitors. C1 is a supercapacitor with a capacitance of 100 farads. And let's say that it's charged up to 2.7 volts. C2 is a regular electrolytic capacitor with a capacitance of 1000 microfarads, but it's charged up to 500 volts. Which capacitor will have more energy stored in it? C1 or C2, what would you say? To calculate the potential energy stored across a capacitor, you could use this formula. It's one half CV squared. So for the first capacitor, it's gonna be one half times the capacitance, which is 100 farads, times the square of the voltage. So half of 100 is 50, 50 times 2.7 squared gives us a potential energy of 364.5 joules. So that's how much energy this particular supercapacitor can store. Now for the second capacitor, it's going to be one half times the capacitance. Keep in mind a microfarad is one times 10 to minus six farads and then times the square of the voltage. So the energy stored in this capacitor is 125 joules. The, the reason why it's relatively high is because of the high voltage that the capacitor is charged to. But nevertheless, the total energy stored across it is still less than the supercapacitor. Now let's talk about how we can increase the capacitance of multiple capacitors connected together and how we can increase the voltage. So let's say we have two supercapacitors connected in series. In that manner. And let's say each supercapacitor has a voltage of 2.7 volts across it. The total voltage across these two capacitors will be 5.4 volts. So to increase the maximum voltage that you can store across multiple capacitors, you want to connect them in series. Now let's say each capacitor has a capacitance of 100 farads. There's a trade-off for this. When you connect them in series, the total capacitance decreases. It's going to be half of the original capacitance, so it's going to be 50. However, the total energy stored doubles because the voltage doubles and in the formula, the potential energy depends on the square of the voltage.
So if you were to calculate the potential energy of the two capacitors combined compared to an individual capacitor, you'll see that the potential energy has increased by a factor of two. Now to increase the capacitance, we can connect the two capacitors in parallel, like this. The total capacitance is the sum of the individual capacitances of each capacitor. So for two capacitors with a capacitance of 100 farads, the total capacitance is now 200 farads. But the voltage didn't change. It's 2.7 volts. So regardless if you connect the two capacitors in series or in parallel, the total energy stored in those two capacitors will double. However, in series, the voltage increases, but the capacitance decreases. In a parallel connection, the capacitance increases, but the voltage stays the same. Now, the formula that you could use to calculate the total capacitance in a series circuit is this one. 1 over Ct is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2, if you ever desire to do so. Now, there are other things that you can do with a capacitor. For instance, let's say if you have an AC signal at the input and you have a capacitor connected across it, the capacitor can filter out AC signals depending on the frequency. So the amplitude of this AC signal will be reduced. So you can divert unwanted signals to ground. So it looks something like this. The impedance that a capacitor can offer to a voltage varying signal, this is called the capacitive reactance, it's 1 over 2 pi Fc. So as the frequency of the signal increases, the impedance decreases, which means that if you have a high frequency signal at the input, it's going to be diverted to ground because the impedance, which you can think of as the resistance of the capacitor to the AC signal, is very low. So high frequency signals will be diverted to the ground, thus its amplitude will be reduced, but a capacitor will pass low frequency signals. There's another application of capacitors that we could use in circuits. I'm going to add a resistor here. Now let's say that at the input we have a signal that looks like this. Let's say we have voltage on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. So this signal has a DC component and an AC component. At the output, we're going to get a signal that looks like this, depending on the value of R. But notice that the DC component has been removed. So a capacitor can be used to block the DC component of a signal while passing the AC component through it. As you mentioned before, signals, AC signals with a high frequency can easily pass through a capacitor, whereas low frequency signals have a high impedance uh, to capacitors. So capacitors will pass through AC signals with high frequencies, but they can block signals, AC signals with low frequencies based on this formula. So as the frequency increases, the impedance decreases. When the frequency of the AC signal decreases, the impedance increases. So capacitors, they can block DC signals and low frequency AC signals, but they pass high frequency AC signals. And this circuit is also known as a high pass filter. It passes high frequencies, but it blocks low frequency signals. Here's another useful feature of capacitors. Capacitors can store the electrical energy given to it by a battery. So in a circuit, we're going to have a light emitting diode in series with a resistor. So let's use a green LED with a voltage drop, let's say, of 2 volts. And let's say the battery has a voltage of 2.5 volts. And let's use a supercapacitor with a capacitance of 10 farads. If you use a 3-volt battery, it might damage 
the 2.7 volt supercapacitor. So just keep that in mind. And let's use a 1 kilo ohm resistor. Initially, the LED will be in the off state when you connect the battery. Current is going to flow from the battery in this manner. It's going to charge up the capacitor. This is conventional current. Electrons flow in the opposite direction. Now keep in mind, a capacitor is made up of two metal plates separated by an insulated material. So even though there's a current flowing in these wires, there's no current flowing through the plates of the capacitor because there's a dielectric there and it doesn't conduct electricity. So what happens is that electrons are flowing from one side of the plate through the circuit to the other side of the plate. So electrons are being stripped out of this plate and being deposited on the other side of the plate. So when a capacitor is charged, this side is going to be negatively charged. It's going to have excess electrons. And this side is going to be electron deficient. So it's going to have positive, it's going to be positively charged because it lost electrons. And so that's how a battery charges up a capacitor. It simply moves the electrons from one side of the capacitor to the other side. So after some time has passed, the capacitor is going to be charged up with a voltage equal to the voltage of the battery. So this side is negatively charged. It has excess electrons. This side is positively charged. It's deficient in electrons. Now that the capacitor has been charged up to the voltage of the battery, current, this is conventional current, which flows in the opposite direction to electron flow, current will now flow from the battery to the LED. So the LED will be on. While the capacitor is charging, the LED is off. But once the capacitor is fully charged by the battery, the LED will be on and current is now flowing through it. Now, once we turn the circuit off, that is once we disconnect the battery, the LED will remain on. So let's remove the battery. At this point, the capacitor will use its stored energy to keep the LED on. As the capacitor releases its energy, the voltage across the capacitor will decrease. When the voltage is less than the voltage drop of the LED, in this case 2 volts, the capacitor will no longer be able to power the LED. So then the LED will be off. So even though you disconnect the battery, the LED will remain on for a given period of time based on the capacitance of the capacitor. And so that's how capacitors are useful in circuits. They can store energy temporarily, and then they can release that energy when needed. Now let's watch a demonstration that shows this particular circuit in action. So as you saw in the demonstration, once the three D-cell batteries were connected to the circuit, the LED didn't turn on immediately. There was a time delay of two to three seconds, and then it turned on. So during that first two to three seconds, the battery was charging the two capacitors. I had to use two capacitors in series so that the maximum voltage that it can hold would be 5.4 volts. Otherwise, the 4.5 volt could damage the individual supercapacitor. So that's why I use two of them in series. Now, once I disconnected the 4.5 volt battery from the circuit, the LED remained on. It didn't turn off immediately. As you saw, it stayed on for a good 15, 20 seconds. The reason for this is that once the 4.5 volt battery has been disconnected from the circuit, the capacitors are using their stored energy to keep the LED powered on. And so that's one of the advantages of capacitors.
they could temporarily store energy from a circuit or from a battery and then re-deliver that energy when needed.